Hey everyone, today I'm starting a new series where I'm going to go through some of the interview questions I've been asked or my friends have been asked in iOS phone screens. So I have a list of about 70 questions which I'll release over the course of a few videos. So make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a video. And these questions will range from junior to mid-level and are primarily meant for helping you get past your initial phone screen. Let's get started. First, what are some of the higher order functions in Swift? A higher order function is a function that takes in one or more functions as arguments or returns a function as its result. So if you saw my previous video on functional programming, I go way more in depth, but you can see that all of these examples here, they take a function as input. So all of these examples, map, reduce, filter, and so on, are considered higher order functions. You can see that in the closure, we are effectively passing in a function for them to use. Next, what does a protocol extension allow us to do? The main advantage of a protocol extension is that it allows you to add additional requirements to a protocol, but also allows you to make some of your protocol functions optional. So for example, in our extension, we had to find a default implementation for the say greeting function. And if we expect the implementation of this function to be similar, wherever it's implemented, we can minimize duplicating code by providing a default implementation in an extension. So whenever we want special behavior, we're free to provide custom implementation like we do in the special greeting class. So the main takeaway here is that it helps you create uh, optional protocol functions and helps you minimize the overall amount of code that you might have to duplicate. What is the difference between equals equals and equals equals equals. So on the left, we have a simple engine class here that implements the equatable protocol. And this gives us an option of defining our implementation for the equals equals operator. And we say that two engines are equal if the horsepower is the same. So we can see here on the right that as long as the integer value matches, we'll return true. Now it gets a little, more a little bit more complicated. With equals, 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 we're asking, does the object on the left-hand side and the object on the right-hand side point to the same reference? Do they point to the same place in memory? So in our first example, when we compare engine one to engine copy, which is also pointing to the same object in memory, equals, equals, equals returns true. But in the next example, we can see that engine one and engine copy are pointing to entirely different objects. So even though the horsepower is the same, equals, equals, equals would return false. Now, what's the difference between a class and a struct? The main point here is that classes and reference types, sorry, classes are reference types and structs are value types. This means that when you pass classes around in your program, you are actually passing a reference to that object. So different parts of your program can share and modify your object because they're all pointing to the exact same place in memory. And when you pass a struct around your program, what gets passed around is actually a copy of that struct. So any modifications to that struct don't affect the original one. And this helps prevent situations where one part of the code accidentally changes values or state in another unrelated part. And both of these options can implement protocols, they can define properties, methods, initializers, uh, they can be extended, but only classes can support inheritance. And structs require less overhead to create and are safer to use because we pass along the values it contains instead of passing reference to the struct itself. So the official Apple recommendation is to start with a struct when you can and change to a class if you need to. However, if the object that you're working with contains a lot of data, like a cache, for example, then it's probably useful for it to be a class so you can share a reference to it and only incur that memory cost once. Now, what is the nil coalescing operator? This is a fairly simple question, and I'm only including this because I was asked this in a phone screen a few years ago, and while I had seen the operator, I didn't know its formal name. So it's similar to a ternary operator, but it just says if the expression on the left resolves to nil, use a backup value on the right instead. So it's just a shorthand for providing a default value in case some function or property is nil. 
Next, what are compilation conditions? So compiler directives allow us to influence the compilation itself. We can use standard flags like debug or define our own flags in our build configuration. Because this happens at compile time, it will literally exclude the other section of code from the executable. You can use this to ensure that any new feature you're not quite ready to release or functionality that should be specific to a platform or software version isn't included in your final executable. In short, it's like a way of telling the compiler to only compile a certain portion of the code and ignore everything else. Now, what are our options for implementing concurrency in iOS? So we have a few options here. We have threads, Grand Central Dispatch, and operation queues. Now, it's not recommended to interact with the threads directly. Convention is to either use GCD or operation queues and have them delegate to the threads. Uh, so since GCD and operation queues are both meant to take some unit of work and dispatch them for execution, it can be a little tricky to know which one to use. Operation queue is actually built on top of GCD, but it adds some extra functionality. It lets you establish dependencies between tasks, so you can specify an order, and it gives you the option of pausing, canceling, and resuming tasks as well. And if you don't need any of this functionality, and you just want to dispatch a block of code to a serial or concurrent queue, you can just go ahead and use GCD directly. I would pick whichever one is the uh, tightest bound to your needs. Now this is an interesting one. What is the responder chain in iOS? So the way that iOS handles all user interaction, whether it's a touch event, a press event, or a shake, is uh, through something called the responder chain. And the responder chain is simply all of the classes that have an opportunity to, to respond to some user input. So if some object can't handle the event, it passes it to the next item in the chain, thereby creating this hierarchy of objects that are equipped to handle user input. So in this example, if the UI label or the UI text field can't handle whatever user event occurs, it'll pass it to its parent view and so on, all the way up to UI application delegate. So that's why when you enter a text field and a system keyboard pops up, I'm sure you've noticed that all subsequent events are sent to the text field to handle. This is because in this case, the text field is now the first responder. It's the first object in this hierarchy that has a chance to respond to user interaction. And that's why when you want to dismiss a keyboard, you have to write something like text field .resigned first responder, which is a text field saying, I'm done being the boss now. And whatever the previous hierarchy was, let's go back to that. What is the difference between strong, weak, and unknown? So all of these keywords are ways of describing how one object references another object. And it's important to understand how ARC or automatic reference counting works in order for these keywords to make sense. So in simple terms, ARC simply counts how many strong references there are to an object. And when that count is zero, that object can be freed from memory. And since we know that a strong reference increments the retain count, we know that the view controller is keeping the delegate from being cleared from memory. The view controller is increasing the delegate's retain count. But if we had a strong reference from the delegate back to the view controller, that would increment the retain count of the view controller. So both, both, both of these items would have a retain count of one and could never be freed. The view controller depends on the delegate and the delegate depends on the view controller. That's what we call a retain cycle. So we can break this retain cycle by making the delegate have a weak reference to the view controller. And you'll notice that any time a child has a reference to its parent, will tend to make it a weak reference. So in simple terms, strong is a default keyword in iOS and will increment the reference count of whatever object it's referring to. Weak does not increment the reference count and it assumes that the object that it references can be nil at some point during execution. Unowned does not increment the reference count either, but promises that the value it references will never be nil. All right, last question. What are your options for persisting data on iOS? So we, we have a few options here, but let's just go through them really quickly. 
user default, keychain, and plist are meant to store a relatively smaller amount of data, and the rest of the options are better suited for storing larger data sets. And keychain is the only option here that will persist across app deletions and reinstalls, and is the only natively supported way of encrypting and storing sensitive information on a user's device. So if you found this video useful, please let me know in the comments below and consider subscribing. I'll have more of these videos coming out soon. Thanks. Bye.